Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is living faith, how to have a living, active, vibrant faith in the living God. Over the series we've been seeing how that faith operates by the Holy Spirit. Faith takes root in our heart when we believe the Word of God. Now, when that happens, changes begin to take place. Our lives are affected. The Bible speaks about what we believe in our heart will affect what comes out of our mouth. Because we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. We confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. The believing in our heart leads to a confession of our mouth, a wonderful declaration of who He is. And so in this program, we're going to be looking at the Confession of Faith. God bless you as you watch and listen. Hello and welcome to this session in the Sword of the Spirit series teaching on living faith. We've been looking at the subject of confession, the confession of faith. And I've stressed in the recent sessions how important it is to understand that there can be no true faith without confession. Confessing the Word of God is a vital part of faith and of believing. I also showed you how that the word for confess in the New Testament is homologeo, which means to say the same thing as. In other words, when you confess the word of God, you are saying the same thing that the word of God says. And in that, you are experiencing the same power that is in the word of God, because God's word in your mouth is as powerful as God's word in his own mouth. That's the idea behind confessing. But it begins in the heart, because true biblical confession is not just you saying the word of God with your lips, but it begins with you believing the word of God in your heart. And then when you speak the word of God, it has the double agreement. Your heart agrees with the Word of God. In other words, you've received it in your heart. And by that, I don't mean emotions. People get misunderstand, have understand, misunderstandings over the word heart. Heart in the Bible is not so much emotions. Heart is the inner person. We're coming back to this point very soon. But when you, on the inner person, you believe the Word of God in your heart, then when you line your mouth up with your heart, which is lined up in turn with the Word of God, you have this double confession. Your heart agrees with the Word, your mouth agrees with your heart. You speak out of your mouth the Word of God that's stored up in your heart, and then the power of God is released and that faith dynamic also functions. Now back to the heart. The faith confession of the Word is based on the Bible's teaching of the heart. And uh, in the scripture, the phrase heart doesn't, of course, mean that, pump, that pumping around blood around the body. Uh, it's actually a poetic description of the reality of the inner person. Your heart is the person on the inside, the inner man, as opposed to the body which is the outer man, the inner man. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. So in other words, the heart is that dynamic motivational center. It's the true person. And so he says, watch the heart. Watch who you really are on the inside because out of your heart flow the issues of life. The heart is the wellspring of life. In other words, that which comes out of your personality, expressed by what you say and by what you do and the way that you behave, that is an expression of what is going on in your heart. 
We understand this too from Proverbs 23 verse 7, where, it, where that miserly person is. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So here we have a person who says one thing, but in his heart he is believing something else. He doesn't want you to eat anymore because he knows how much every bit on that table costs. He knows which supermarket it came from, which shelf it came from, how much it costs him. He says, have some more. You don't want any more, do you? Uh, this is the difference between people who are hospitable and those who are not hospitable. You visit a home of somebody who is hospitable, they say, you will be staying for something to eat, won't you? Somebody who is not hospitable says, you will have had something to eat already, haven't you? <laughs> uh, but here we have somebody who is saying one thing have some more you're welcome you're welcome but in his heart he is not saying that at all it's rather like the definition of hospitality that i heard very recently being hospitable is making people feel at home when you wish they were at home uh, well anyway yes it took a little while for the penny to drop but anyway what you are in your heart is the true you now, the Bible says, and Jesus himself taught, that the heart has an overflow. Did you know that? The heart has an overflow. In Matthew chapter 12, it speaks about this overflow. It says uh, in verse 35, I beg your pardon, verse 34, Matthew 12, verse 34, You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the treasure of his good heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And so we see out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you're full of in your heart comes out of your mouth, because the mouth is the overflow of the heart. So the overflow of your heart is your mouth. When the heart gets full to overflowing, what flows out, flows out of your mouth. So it's what you say truly uh, indicates what's going on in your heart. Then later on in that same passage, uh, Jesus says this principle is so accurate that you will be judged by your words. Matthew 12 verse 37, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. And uh, then he goes on to speak about every careless word that you say. So it's not just that you're going to be judged by the words that you say, it's by, it's by those careless words, those unguarded words that truly reveal what's in your heart. Because you can say the right thing, and in so many contexts religious people do. As Jesus quotes in Matthew chapter 15 from Isaiah 29, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's what they say, it's the slip of the lip that portrays what's in the heart. And so this is a very important principle of the human personality. What you're full of in your heart will be expressed through your mouth. And so, when you are full of faith, what's going to come out of your mouth? Faith language, faith talk. Again, let me remind you, Jesus is not talking about empty confession here. It's important that you uh, confess out of a heart that is full. And uh, we know that um, when your heart is full of salvation, you're going to confess salvation. When in your heart you're full of healing and grasping healing, then you know that you will speak words of healing. I want to also point out that this agreement of your heart with your mouth can work the other way. Let me, let me just explain this. I think we should go back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth, this is verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that, God's, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so there is a sense in uh, which you can speak God's word and when you speak God's word, it can touch your heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? When I, when I speak against empty confession, I am not speaking against people who take the word of God and look at the word of God and say the word of God, 
because that is actually part of the process of hearing. Be careful what you, that you must take heed of what you hear. So when you speak God's word, it's a way of hearing God's word. So in your heart, you may be struggling with some area of unbelief, but you take the Bible and you look at the words and you read the words, you may memorize that, and you may repeat the word. I am the Lord who heals you. Thank you, Lord, for that word. I am the Lord who heals you. And you repeat that word, not in an empty way, but in a way in which you are seeking to hear that word for your own heart. And then there comes a moment when you say that word and that word touches your heart. Because he said, Paul says in Romans 10, uh, how is it? The word that we preach, it is in your mouth and in your heart. And in a sense, it can begin by you declaring the word of God. It is the word of God. It has power. And in your own declaration, you are hearing that word come to you and it can touch your heart. But that's not confession. That's more like hearing the word of God. You're speaking it in order to hear it. But then when you believe this word, it's touched your heart and your heart has entered into faith. Then when you repeat that word, it's confessing. It's confessing the word of God. Okay, so now uh, it's important when we grasp the place of confession that we don't just leave it there. Faith is a kind of progressive thing. It grows and develops. Truly it begins by hearing the word of God and then by believing that word deep in your heart. And then it moves into confessing the word of God. Because once you truly believe it, you can confess it, but it doesn't end there. It's more than confession. Faith requires more than confession. It requires action. Action. So we're going to look at the actions of faith. So living faith, if it is a really living faith, not dead faith, if it's living faith, it will produce results in your life. It will have an effect upon you. It will have an effect upon what you say and on what you do. In fact, so truly, you can say this, show me what you do and I will show you what you believe. Your faith will be demonstrated by what you see. Your faith will be vindicated by, your faith will be demonstrated by what you do. Your faith will be vindicated by what you do. Your faith will be seen by what you do. Your faith will be completed by what you do. Your faith will be fulfilled by what you do. Can't emphasize how important it is to grasp this. Faith is not just a question of saying, well, I believe God, sit back and he's, he's going to make it happen. It takes faith, which is put into action, to see the fulfillment come. There are both visible and verbal results. It's the principle of the tree and the fruit again. When, when the tree grows, it produces fruit. The root produces fruit. And the fruit of faith is actions, obedient actions. Now, faith without obedience is not faith. But obedience without faith is just as dangerous. That's legalism. We've got to be very careful in this, in this matter of, of faith because, you see, we can say, well, it's very easy. All I have to do is uh, just um, obey this word. It's obedience. That's the key. Lay hands on the sick. I'm obeying the word of God. But if you are obeying the word of God without faith, you're just going through the motions. You're just going through the actions. Actions without faith is empty. Faith without actions is dead. The two go together. They must go together. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
It's impossible to please God. Faith is about pleasing God. Faith isn't about you getting what you want. Faith is about God getting what God wants. It's about pleasing Him. And it's about obeying Him and living for His glory. So you must, if you want a life of faith, you must live a life of obedience. A life that honors God. And you must honor God in your actions as well as your beliefs and in your words. In Hebrews 11, we have what we call faith's role of honor. We have the list of these people who without exception did great exploits through faith. They demonstrated their faith by what they did. You could see their faith in what they did. And uh, their faith became active. Their faith became visible. An invisible faith is a contradiction in terms. It's not possible for faith to be kept a secret. It must be worked out in actions. If you have faith but no actions, well, you don't have faith, really. It's not living faith. Now, living faith determines your actions. It determines your choices. It determines the direction of your life. As somebody who is living in faith, their life will be purposeful and it will be going in a direction. It won't be aimless. It will be going in God's direction. It'll be walking in God's way. Now, we need to understand that in James chapter 2, and I think it'd be good to turn to James uh, chapter 2, that the relationship between faith and actions is absolutely essential. Because James is very, very correct when he says, faith without actions is dead. Now, you've got to understand, and I touched on this in an earlier session, that uh, some people say Paul and James contradict each other. Because Paul says, you are justified by faith, and James seems to say, you are justified by works. Now, let's say straight away that James is not talking about works and doing things to get your acceptance before God. He's not talking about that. When Paul uses the word works, he means what you try to do to make yourself right with God. And he says you can't do anything to make yourself right with God. Not even faith is a work. Faith is not even a doing thing. Faith comes by the Holy Spirit who enables you to lay hold of what God has done. So you are justified by faith. Now, when James speaks about works, the context in which he is speaking about works are not works of the law as a basis of being right with God. He's talking about works of obedience. He's actually talking about works of faith, not works of the law. And you must understand that, and that difference will help you understand that James and Paul are saying the same thing because they're both actually agreeing with each other and emphasizing different things. Paul is talking about works of the law which cannot justify us. And James is talking about works of faith or actions of faith that do demonstrate that your faith is real. That do demonstrate that you have been justified, declared righteous by faith because your faith is real. And James is very, very practical. He's talking about the outworking of faith. And so... Uh, in fact, I think it would be very good at this point if we look at uh, the whole of that passage. And I will just uh, look it up now. And uh, James chapter 2. And uh, he goes on to say in verse 14. James chapter 2 verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but not have works? Can faith save him? What's he saying here? Can faith save you? No. For a start, he's probably talking about the person who comes in need. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? What good is it? Does that faith help him? Does that faith save him? He's not talking about 
whether faith is saving you or not in that context. But even if he were, he would be meaning, does this kind of faith save you? What kind of faith? Faith without works. No, because that kind of faith is dead. Dead faith doesn't save anybody. So he says, the kind of faith which is real faith is living faith. Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now I prefer to read this as not works, but actions. It makes it a better sense to us to read it as actions. He's talking about the actions of faith. So he says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have actions, is dead. Faith without actions is dead. It's unproductive. It's not producing anything. It's not real. It's not vital. It's not living faith. Then verse 18 he says, Someone will say, You have faith, and I have actions. I have works. And he says, Show me your faith without your actions, and I will show you my faith by my actions. Let me make a very important point here. Here James is saying, This is how you see my faith, by what I do. How you can tell whether I am a believer by what I do. This is not the test that you apply to yourself. Hello? Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Why do I pause to emphasize that? It's not even in the notes. Why do I emphasize that? I'll tell you why. Because many people are suffering from introspection. They're always looking at themselves because the devil says, you call yourself a believer? Look at you. Look at your life. Look how terrible you are. Look at the things you do. Look, how, look at the things you do. Look how you fail. And you start looking at yourself. And you start saying, oh my, 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 I can't be a, I'm not a good Christian. I must be a bad Christian. Maybe I'm not even a Christian at all. And the devil says, well, maybe you are not, you miserable thing. You know what your mistake has been? Apart from listening to the devil, that's the first thing, don't listen to him, he's a liar. When he speaks, say, liar, liar. <laughs> Get back into the truth. Second mistake is to look at yourself. Never look at yourself apart from seeing yourself in Christ. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And even when somebody says to you, show me your faith, you show them your, your faith by what you do. It's there to demonstrate the reality of your faith to other people, to witness of your faith to other people. It's not a test by which you discover whether you're a true believer or not. Think about it. What test would there be? I know, if I, I'm a true believer because I've done good works. How many good works have I done? Well, I don't know. Does it matter? Oh, well, maybe it does matter. If I did 10 good works, would that prove that I'm a, I'm a believer? But if I did nine but not 10, would that be? Or would I have to do 11? Is, is 11 enough? There's no definition of how many good works you have to do before you demonstrate that you're a believer to yourself. Do you understand that? That's totally, it's arguing the wrong case altogether. We have been called to look to Jesus. I know I'm saved because Jesus died for me and I'm looking to Jesus. I'm not looking to myself. So remember this. Don't let the devil take these verses and, and use them against you. All right, but the truth is this. Some say, I have faith. You can, you can, you can, you can um, have your faith. And others say, well, I'm, I'm going to get on with the actions. And there's two kinds of people, people who like to sit back and people who like to get up and do. And uh, we have to be careful here. And James says, show me your faith without your actions and I will show you my faith by my actions. Then he goes on to talk about what the heart of this matter is. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even demons believe 
and shudder. It's clear that James is talking about an empty intellectual kind of faith that is not real, it's not vital, it's not life-changing, it's not dynamic, it's not a real relationship with God. The demons believe they have no relationship with God. He is clearly talking about empty, dead, pretend faith, or at least this intellectual, superficial faith. Of course the devil believes. The devil knows, but he doesn't have faith. James is talking about true faith. He says, I want you, but do you want to know, verse 20, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then he goes on to say, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Now this is where it's confusing because he uses the phrase justification by works. And we know that the Bible teaches justification by faith. Well, they don't, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Here, he's speaking about Abraham's faith being made complete by actions. And then he says, verse 22, do you see that, uh, no, verse 21, was not Abraham justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Read on. Do you see that faith was, was working together with actions and that by actions or by works, faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. When did that happen? Genesis 15. When did Abraham offer Isaac? Genesis 22. What happened first, his believing or his actions? His believing. And what happened when he believed? God counted him righteous. Abraham was justified by faith. James proves it. But he goes on to say that the faith that justified Abraham also grew and developed and came to maturity. Because his faith was made perfect by actions. And we see Abraham in Genesis 22 being a mature man of God, even being prepared to sacrifice his own son in obedience and out of faith, knowing that if that happened, God would even raise him from the dead. That's how mature Abraham's faith was. 